And we are back. And uh, no, I'm not going to name drop any, anything this week. I want you to know that. Well, because you did so much last week. Yeah, I, I think I, people. We got I, a lot of emails about that. No, I hit my hit my quota. No, we didn't. Uh, but you know what, Mark? The um, we're going to dive right into it. We still have tons to do. The uh, the the whole Oscar aftermath continues. The, it does. Uh, yeah, it sure does. Look what look what comes out this week. Look what, what we got this week. What do we have this week, Wade? Big short. The Big Short. Get right into it. Won two Oscars. Uh, yes, it did. Yes, it did. Wait, what was the wait, second what, one? Wait, one adapted it won screenplay. screenplay. It didn't get a second one. It got just got adapted screenplay. Oh, really? That's all I got. A lot of people were picking it for Best Picture, but Why I told would I think them it won something else. No, no, no. Best, the, the Spotlight won two, which is the fewest of any film winning Best Picture since 1952 in the the uh, the DeMille Greatest Show on Earth uh, monstrosity. But um, you know what? Big Short. Uh, one of my favorite films of the year. Really great. Really terrific. Uh, you know what? It's it's, it's uh, a great film. It's a very difficult subject that he did not shy away from. Not only, he, not only did he not shy away from his complexities, he dove right in in the most creative way possible. Let me just point out, Adam McKay is an Oscar winner. You mean the guy who wrote... Uh... Yeah, like whatever, Anchorman. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, the, the, the guy who's done all of Will Ferrell's like shticky shtick is an Oscar winner. I know. It's so weird. It just you never know where talent's going to come out in this business. It's so strange. I mean, this is such an accomplished film. It's not just funny, but it's. I mean, here's the here's the thing. They took a book that is essentially a textbook. It's like taking a textbook. It's like taking a financial textbook and turning it into an entertaining movie. It's like somebody hands you and hands you a book and says, "Here's a here's a, a, a law textbook on uh, litigating divorce. Uh, I'd like for you to you know write Romeo and Juliet." It is one of those weird films where like it's so complex, and the moment you hear something explained, you understand it. But then when they bring it up again twenty minutes later, you forgot what it, it meant. It Does so many daring things. It takes it takes something that is still really an open wound for a lot of people: the financial crisis of two thousand eight. And the the and it takes the, all of the financial complexities of that thing, and multiple different storylines that never really intersect. I mean, you have all these different people doing things. You got Steve Carell, and he's doing his thing, and then you've got Christian Bale, and he's doing his thing, and then you got the two guys that are doing their little thing with uh, with Brad Pitt, and and all these different stories. And then you you whenever you feel like they're it's getting a little too complicated. Hey, let's have an actor play him or herself and explain a term and break the fourth wall. It's so it's so daring and it's so risky and it winds up being so entertaining and yet so upsetting at the same time. It's true, and it's actually a great bookend film with uh, Ninety Nine Homes. Yeah, which all I enjoyed immensely. Yeah, it, it, this would be a great double feature with Ninety Nine Homes. You see both sides of it, and Christian Bale, man. That guy just he just kills it in this. Oh yeah, he kills it in everything. Just He's Christian Bale. It. He's so good. Anyway, uh, you got to get it. This is just one of the best films of last year. Blu-ray, DVD, and uh, ultraviolet. Uh, take it with you anywhere. Adam McKay. Freaking Adam McKay is an Oscar winner. It's so amazing to me. Uh, and Brad Pitt for producing this thing. God bless you. Uh, another new Regency, by the way. This is also uh, Arnon Milchan. You know, not just that the guy. Revenant. He's won he's like just, uh, that guy's won like a couple of Best Picture Oscars. He, he, well, uh, he, he won the re- uh, he won um, Twelve Years a Slave, Years a Slave and, Slave, and uh, Birdman. Birdman. And then this year he had this in Revenant. It's just unbelievable. The cray, guy, cray. Uh, deleted scenes, uh, little bits on the casting and behind the scenes and uh, featurettes. It's all good stuff. All really, really good stuff. No, uh, no commentary, but it's it's really good. Well, uh, uh, yes, sir. So the guy, basically, the guy who wrote the story, who got a story credit for Get Hard, yeah, with Will Ferrell, yeah. and Kevin Hart, yeah, just won an Oscar. Amazing. Adam McKay. There you go. It's crazy, nutty, it's goofy. And then um, my favorite film, my favorite English language film of last year, uh, which was nominated for a few Oscars, not for director or picture. I'm sad to say, but it was nominated for six in other categories including screenplay and actress and sporting actress, cinematography, costume design, and score, and it deserved them all. Didn't win anything, but uh, that's okay, because it's a great film, and it's the the best film that Todd Haynes has ever done, and that's Carol, which I just thought was amazing. Shot on Super 16, by the way. This is the first Super 16 film to ever get an Oscar nomination for screen, for cinematography. And it's gorgeous. It's phen- phenomenal. I mean, it, it re- and it, well, they did it on purpose. It's not like they were cheap. 
They just wanted to recreate the shimmer and the sheen of the 1950s, make it look like a 1950s, you know, uh, kind of Douglas Sirk. Thing. And I and I, I I bet there was there was an impulse to go digital because with I'm digital sure everything looks all beautiful and shiny and pristine. Well, anyway, this is an adaptation of The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith. Anyone who, who knows Patricia Highsmith knows she is a, a favorite of thriller directors. Uh, obviously, the, the Ripley stories have been done a number of times by many different directors, most recently by Anthony Minghella, talented Mr. Ripley. And, of course, her, you know, Hitchcock loved her, and she and Hitchcock had many, you know, strangers on a train and many similar sensibilities about these, these creepy, creepy... Uh, Claude Chabral, of course, has, has adapted Highsmith. So, you know, she was a great thriller writer. But this is basically a lesbian romance uh, with Kate Blanchett as the older married woman and Rooney Mara as the younger woman. And um, the, 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 all of the ways in which this weaves itself into their, uh, their other lives. Uh, Phyllis Nage did a tremendous adaptation of the book. Her screenplay is perfect. Haynes' direction is perfect. I mean, it's just it, the whole film is so sensitive and nuanced. It's absolutely wonderful. Uh, Highsmith, of course, as an individual, was, um, you know, someone of rather questionable character. She was anti Semite. No, known to be anti Semitic and uh, quite likely a Nazi sympathizer, um, uh, bisexual, and really, uh, t- by all accounts, rather mean and unkind to most people around her. However, Phyllis Nage uh, would debate that and contends that Highsmith was, you know, before she passed, was very encouraging to her. She, she, you know, told her to, you know, go for it. And this film is basically the culmination of that. So whatever you think of Highsmith personally, this is a hell of a film and has a couple of high-powered uh, producers behind it as well and Christine Vachon and Stephen Woolley. No slouches, either one of them. Uh, so I just love this film. I can't get enough. The Blu-ray is gorgeous. The photo- cinematography is preserved. Uh, it's just my favorite English language film of last year. And my the only film I think I liked better, we will also be talking about, but that's a foreign language film. Oh, you mean Sisters with Tina, Fe- uh, Tina Fey and Amy Poehler? Nope. Uh, Sisters uh, continues Tina Fey's uh, streak of uh, uh, films that are not as funny as she is. Speaking of, you know, uh, we're right now in the second week of Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Did you see it? I did. What would you think? I didn't like it. I didn't either. It's 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 a mess. It's a mess. It's like it's it, they're trying to do. It's like they're trying to do Mash meets Private Benjamin meets uh, Catch Twenty Two, and it yeah, doesn't really the, the, the funny stuff and then it, the I dramatic stuff. I couldn't figure out if she was trying to be funny and failing, or if she was trying to be dramatic and failing. I couldn't. I couldn't figure out which of the. Well, at, at first I thought maybe the two directors, who I, I am fans of them, maybe they, no, they, 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 they they didn't trust the dramatic material enough just to be dramatic. Like yeah. you know, you know what it is that that blending of drama and comedy is very difficult. Yeah. As opposed to this film, which is either dramatic or funny. And the, the point I made on radio, I think that uh, there that we're still too close to Afghanistan for that to be ironic. I don't think we can be ironic about that situation yet. MASH was almost 20 years after the Korean War ended. You know, uh, you can be ironic. Catch-22, even longer after... If, if, if MASH was about Vietnam, it would be a little yeah, too much. Yeah, no, no, much. You, you can't. You, you, we're, still too, we're still too close to it. We're still too much in it. And it's, it's impossible to be ironic if you're still that close. And what, what's a little sad about, about Whiskey Tango is the fact that it's a real girl power kind of a film because yeah. it's with Tina Fey yeah. and Margot Robbie. They yeah. play the, the, the reporters. They're both female. They're both yeah. great in their field. The network president in the film, woman... Yeah, played by Cherry Jones. Yeah, so there's like there's like a real girl power thing that they kind of didn't really mind that much. No. You know, they didn't really mind that. I think it would have been interesting. Well, anyway. anyway, sisters, um, yeah. you know Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, we all love them. They play uh, sisters, and they they go home to clean out their uh, child at home after their family's going to sell the house, and they decide to uh, live it up high school style one more time for a big party. You know. Uh, it seemed like there was an opportunity here for like a lot of you know warmth and uh, and you know and stuff about family and uh, but in the end it just sort of went for just kind of lowest common denominator party stuff and I just felt like it didn't really it didn't really live up to its potential you know and uh, so uh, this to me is just a really a Saturday night rental if there's mm-hmm. nothing else going on you can rent this but you won't get much out of it lame uh, and then we have a movie that uh, was for a moment. Considered sort of a possible uh, Oscar thing, uh, wound up not being one, which was the uh, Weinstein Company's release of Justin Kurzel's Macbeth. Uh, you know, Macbeth comes around every once in a while in, in movies. Orson Welles and Polanski both took their, their stabs at it, uh, both of which are better than this. <coughs> I, you know what? I, well, here's the thing. I, uh, 
as as Shakespeare ad- adaptation, it, it's fine, but it was it's beautifully shot. It's gorgeous. Well, he, but did you get the feeling that he really just wished that it was all battle scenes? That he just he preferred to not actually have any dialogue. He just would have. I mean, those battle scenes are great, and he really gets a thrill oh, out yeah. of kick out of I directing mean, them. It, it, you know what it is? I was reminded of uh, um, Valhalla Rising, the the Refn film. Very much so. You know, had the had the same same kind of same kind of vibe and the same. Yeah, it did. I mean, Michael Fassbender is terrific as Macbeth. He's really really good. He has a, a much more angry, angsty take on it. Um, Marion Cotillard, much as I absolutely adore her, I don't know that she's right for Lady Macbeth. I don't either. There was that one, there was that and one soliloquy right. where it's just, I, it was, she was kneeling, I think, and the camera was looking up at yeah, her. And yeah. I was just like, you know what? I'm not sure that you're the right person for this. Yeah, it didn't didn't feel right to me. It, it just didn't. Uh, I mean, she gives it her best, but she just it doesn't doesn't feel right. Anyway, uh, there's a featurette on here in a Q and A with Michael Fassbender, who might have gotten nominated for this if he hadn't have done Steve Jobs in the same year, but uh, he did. Anyway, it's beautifully shot. It's not bad. It's certainly uh, I don't think it's as good as the Wells or the Polanski films, but I would you know I saw the um, I saw the, the the great West End production with Patrick Stewart, which is kind of a whole fascist. Uh, environment and it's very multimedia and that thing was mind blowing. I'd love for them to do a feature film for, uh, of that particular production, really blow it out cinematically. Okay, so for the record, it took Wade seven minutes to name drop. Oh man, podcast. that wasn't named. I just said I saw it live. I saw the sh- the West End production. There's All nothing. Right. Was that a bad thing? No, it's okay. you know it's uh, but it's, it's, it's name dropping. It's, it's, it's a little douchey, but whatever. Okay. It's, it's who you are. <laughs> All right, and then a uh, real quick one for Easter and Passover coming up. It's a uh, we got a big it's big time for the Jews and the Christians, and uh, people always find a way to release something that's very Passovery and uh, very Eastery. And we have a really big deal uh, actually. This is rather extraordinary. Shout has, has released on Blu-ray the complete uh, Franco Zeffirelli production of Jesus of Nazareth, the miniseries. Uh, for its 40th anniversary on Blu-ray. And uh, I was not a fan of this at the time, uh, but again, that was the same year as Star Wars and then Close Encounters, and I was a kid, and you know, I didn't really want to see a miniseries. Uh, but uh, you know what? It, looking at it again, it's not bad. It's not bad. I mean, there I can quibble with bits of it. Robert Powell is a rather dour, um, kind of intimidating Jesus, but he's, if you like that, he's very good at doing that. And Bancroft, um, James Farentino, James Earl Jones, uh, Ernest Borgnine, Lawrence Olivier, it's just James Mason, Christopher Plummer. It's un- everyone shows up in this thing. Uh, Rod Steiger, Peter Ustinov, Michael York, Olivia Hussey. It's just unbelievable. Everybody shows up in this thing. And um, it is it is much better, I think, looking back than I, I gave it credit for at the time. So, um, yeah, no extras particularly. There are a few new interviews on here. But uh, otherwise, this is the complete Jesus of Nazareth miniseries from 1977. And uh, it looks very, very good. It is, it's about seven hours long, but um, very, very good, I got to say. It's very, very good. Uh, it, it holds up. And then also on the uh, more passover end of things... Uh, we have the Bible Stories uh, releases. You can get either Ben Kingsley in Moses or Richard Harris and Barbara Hershey in Abraham. You can get them separately. These are all Emmy-nominated, by the way. These were all really you know, quite highly acclaimed. Or you can get a, an actual uh, boxed set which has the four-movie collection of Abraham, Moses, Jacob, and Joseph. Uh, Joseph. Uh, Abraham, Moses, Jacob, and Joseph, all in a in a boxed set. Um, these productions are not bad. They're they're obviously very clearly low budget television productions, but uh, they are not terrible. And um, Ben Kingsley and Moses is actually much much more convincing than um, than uh, was the Ridley Scott film of uh, of last year, which was just kind of a kind of a mess. So. Um, Anyway, that's out there as well. So you should check those out. They have the Dove seal of approval. Those are also from Shout Factory. Is it my turn to talk now? Yes. Okay. By all means. I, I have no names to drop. However, I can talk about American Horror Project. This thing annoyed me just by the title. It's called American Horror Project as if, like, like in Walmart, a bunch of conservatives will yeah. like go into the store and go, it's an American horror project. <laughs> I love America. Go America. Like, who cares? 
Anyway, it's... Uh, As opposed to the Cuban horror project, which what, would be... Which would just be living there as a yeah. horror project. Yeah. Anyway, these are... Uh, this is a hundred, couple films that are a bit under the radar. You know, they're not like uh, Not a Living Dead and, you know, the more famous ones. But, you know, there's still some stuff here. If you're a super-duper horror aficionado, um, Carnival of Blood is from 1973. Shot for, like, $1.98 in Philadelphia. Uh, Christopher Spleeth is the guy, or Spieth is the guy who directed it. And it's uh, it's a little it's pretty funky. It's definitely a, a film of its time because it's kind of kitschy and kind of performance arty, and there's like these kind of you know low budget gore effects. Um, so that one is kind of interesting, if nothing else, because it's emblematic of its time. The other one is The Witch Who Came from the Sea, which is uh, probably the best directed of the films, and uh, it's about this uh, this woman who was uh, she, she was abused as a child, and so she begins to kind of disassociate. And, uh, you know, she takes out her revenge on guys, uh, a lot of them celebrities. So that's kind of yeah. interesting. Um, it was it was shot by Dean Cundy, which is like a big oh, deal. Oh, yeah. Good, Cundy good, direct, uh, good he, DP. He shot John Carpenter's The Thing and yeah. Back to the Future. Yeah, it was a big big deal in the 80s. And this is obviously, this is in 1976, a little bit uh, earlier. Then uh, we had The Premonition, which um, I didn't really um, like that much. It's kind of a little bit like Audrey Rose. Um so I would probably pass on that one. I would definitely get this if you're a fan of like deep, deep horror in the sense of like, you know, you want your 1970s era exploitation stuff. Uh, so we got that. We also have from the good folks at Arrow did a great job on a bad film called The Mutilator. Yeah. This is on DVD and uh, Blu-ray. I have to say. There's a book coming out on the on the whole Arrow collection, by the way, which I'm uh, we can talk about in a future show. Uh, Arrow. They really knocked out of the park. I they, mean, they, the they, 2K they, restoration. Yeah, these things are great. You know, it's uh, the audio is not great. I mean, they do give you the original audio, the 1.1, which doesn't sound that great. But anyway, there's an audio commentary with um, with uh, Buddy Cooper, who produced it and directed it and also wrote it. And there's alternate opening titles, and there's screen tests, which are pretty funny. And then there's behind-the-scenes reel, which is, you know, really super low budge, but kind of funny. And uh, the movie is pretty much about a mutilator. Well, now, wait a minute. It's called The Mutilator. Mm -hmm. And you're saying it's about a mutilator? That's what I'm that's saying. That's amazing. Anyway, he, uh, the idea is that I he, love, uh, I, I love he stalks the people with, a, with, with like this axe. Read the byline. Hook, this hook thing. Read the byline. Uh, by sword, but, by pick, by axe, bye-bye. <laughs> that's the tagline. That's so great. By sword, by pick, by axe, bye-bye. <laughs> Anyway, so, so uh, obviously it's about a bunch of kids who uh, go for uh, they go away for a couple of days, go, go get drunk and laid, but He's in the end they wind up all dying because this guy runs around with a hook. He's a mutilator. Anyway, Vincent Price. If you don't know who Vincent Price was, ask your parents. Vincent Price was synonymous <laughs> with uh, with horror. Films. This is the third volume of his films. Yes. Yeah, it's good I stuff. To, it's good stuff. I mean, I think volumes one and two have the best of them. This yeah, is, they now do. you start to get down to the not not the dregs, but not his best. Yeah. But the good thing with Scream Factory is that they always do such a great job with this stuff. Uh, Master of the World uh, is uh, actually you know what? Actually, Tower of London is my favorite one. But Master of the World does have an audio commentary. Um, Tower of London has a new interview with Roger Corman and uh, Diary of a Madman looks good considering it's so old and also A Cry of the Banshee which is from 1970 that has a pretty good um, high definition new master so if you love Vincent Price again not all these films are good Tower of London is my favorite but uh, uh, I would definitely check this out and we are now going to go into some Kino titles Kino's released a whole bunch of new stuff um, the two that I think are the best and most noteworthy are part of their F.W. Murnau collection, uh, which includes uh, Fritz Lang's Spies and Woman in the Moon. Uh, this is all uh, you know, German uh, expressionist silent film stuff. And uh, the, the the essentially, the, I mean, Spies is a is a is a big deal. Spies was re, uh, only recently restored, not even in terms of making it look better, but the complete running time was just so fractured. And uh, they wound up finding almost as much additional material as was originally thought to be the last remaining vestiges of the film. So the film went from being something like like 95 or 100 minutes to uh, 150 minutes. I mean, it almost doubled in length uh, after they uncovered the, uh, the new footage. And... Um, I actually went to a screening at the Academy right after they did this, 
where uh, they they actually gave you cues while you were watching the film as to where the new footage was and where the old footage was, and you could see where the you know how where the the, the ellipses happened and what the what had actually been uh, been replaced and where the you know what they would lost. So you could sort of see where the story took these jumps and now had these new chunks in it. Really amazing stuff. Uh, anyway, this is from 1928. 150 minutes of what may be the original serial uh, thriller concept uh, in film. It's just unbelievable. Uh, tremendous music, uh, really just wonderful, wonderful restoration. The, the score by Neil Brand is great on here. It's a piano score, and it's just absolutely perfect. This is a 2K digital restoration. Uh, and uh, you also get a 72-minute um, documentary on the making of the film, and then the original uh, German trailer, which is long. It's really, really cool. Uh, this thing is just the, the whole mad scientist serialized uh, espionage thing is, is just done so beautifully. It's absolutely fantastic. And then uh, Fritz Lang's um, Woman in the Moon is uh, almost as good. This is from uh, 1929. And uh, all of the and by the way, when we say these are from the F. W. Murnau collection, they are that doesn't mean they're Murnau films. These are Fritz Long films, which were part of the Murnau library per se. So I don't want people to think that that Murnau had anything to do with these, uh, but they're just from the Murnau collection. So uh, anyway, this was uh, produced and directed by Fritz Long the uh, following year in 1929. And uh, it is, uh, in many respects, almost like taking not only spies but Metropolis an extra step. This is uh, all about the first trip to the moon, and uh, it is amazingly cool and really well done. And the production value and the set direction is really sort of amazing for 1929. I mean, you can tell the artifice, but when you realize just what went into it, I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. And it's um, more than the, uh, the silent trip to the moon the original silent trip to the moon, which is all, you know, uh, just sort of uh, camera tricks and whatnot. This is actually a little more scientifically credible, and he really makes an effort to, to legitimize it in some respect, and it's got, just got a cool vibe to it. So anyway, uh, this also has a piano score by Javier Perez de Azpecia, I guess is how you would pronounce it, 2K Digital Restoration, and uh, a documentary, a short documentary, is a documentary at, I guess you could call it, on how this is technically the first science fiction film. I wouldn't agree, but it makes an interesting case. Wade. Yes. A Cop from 1988. This is an interesting film because, not that it's a great film, it's an okay film, it's a police uh, procedural with um, uh, James Woods. Uh, there's two names in it that make it interesting. The first name is James Elroy, because it's based on his uh, novel, Blood on the Moon. James Elroy, of course, gave us uh, L.A. Confidential. And uh, this is another slice of, you know, L.A. noir with, you know, corrupt cops going crazy and whatever. It was directed by James B. Harris. Now, James B. Harris, people might know, as a, a Kubrick's early partner. collaborator with uh, Stanley Kubrick. That's right. It was uh, Kubrick Harris Productions. They had they, they produced all that early stuff together. So James B. and this is 1988. This is yeah. you know this is oh, yeah. well beyond like his you know Kubrick's 1950s I, I the guess, killing glory and all days that. whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so James B. Harris he didn't do a lot of directing but he did direct this and it's really not that bad. So um, if you want a little piece of uh, film history, James Elroy, you know it's going to be good because he's such a great writer and knows L.A. so well with L.A. Confidential. James B. Harris with his with his tight connection to Stanley Kubrick, and of course uh, James Woods, who plays crazy cops better than anyone, at least back then. Also, from the good folks at uh, Kino Lorber, we have the Rosary Murders. Uh, this film is okay. It's with Donald Sutherland and uh, Charles Durning. There's a uh, guys running around killing uh, nuns and priests. So um, yeah. You know, it's all about whether you're into this sort of thing. Uh, what I did like about it is that it was co-written by Elmore Leonard. Now. Elmore Leonard did not write the novel which it is based, but he did co-write the uh, the screenplay. You know, Elmore Leonard is a great writer, but uh, I tend to go with the films that are based on his books more than his for hire stuff. So this is a little less successful for me, but um, yeah, The Rosary Murders. And uh, rounding out our Kino Lorber coverage, a bunch of action films from the 50s, 60s, 70s movies that basically, usually, typically, and all of the, the artwork and all these, it's kind of funny. You can tell they're all from the same era because they all involve these, you know, the artwork is always a picture of a bunch of guys all charging 
with guns blazing and usually helicopters and boats and tanks behind them. You know, it's a everything was sort of trying to the, the A level stuff from that period was Bridge in the River Kwai and The Great Escape and The Dirty Dozen, Bridget Ramagan, and then there's a whole lot of B level stuff which uh, you know is even below like where where Eagles Dare and and the, the Eastwood stuff. Uh, Iron Cross is, and there's another level below all of that, which is just guys just blowing stuff up, and it's all it's all decent, it's respectable. Uh, the one that does not have guns, but may as well because it has swords. Swords are like guns. Uh, the Vikings with Kirk Douglas, one of the most ridiculous Viking movies ever made. There is nothing historically accurate or credible about this. It is just truly hysterical. Uh, it, it it has once again Kirk Douglas and Tony Curtis together again. Uh, you know, before they did Spartacus, so not together again. But this is a you know for you who've seen Spartacus, this is another pairing uh, of the two of them. And uh, I don't know. It, there's something just weird about putting Kirk Douglas and Tony Curtis in movies together. It never feels right. Neither of them feel period right. You know what I mean? Like Kirk Douglas, well, they I didn't can, have Chef uh, uh, Chef Clins. Cleft chins. I actually said chapped cleanse. Um, the, the microphone is aimed at, at a non existent person. Right, exactly. Okay, so anyway, uh, Richard Fleischer directed this. Fleischer, we've, we talked about him last week. He, he comes in and you know, does workmanlike jobs on just about everything that he did, but never, not really a distinguished director in, in any respect. Um, but he did a lot of A list movies. I mean, he did a lot of memorable stuff. The Vikings is just, it's just silly. It's just Kirk Douglas. The, the only movie that's sillier than this is The Northman. Um, anyway, so look, it's a Viking movie with Kirk Douglas. What do you want? Uh, it's just, there's, this is, there's just nothing else to, to say about it. Um, there's a featurette with Fleisch run here and, and uh, some trailers, but otherwise it's just, uh, it's just really kind of silly. Uh, it's just silly period stuff. Now here come the gun, the guys in gun movies. Uh, my favorite here is with Hugh O'Brien, who I always thought was a really underrated actor. Hugh O'Brien, James Mitchum, two really gritty guys. Put guns in their hands and let them blaze away. That is macho stuff, but not nearly as macho as the man in the middle of the Ambush Bay trilogy. Mark, who is in the middle? Who is between Hugh O'Brien and, G- and, and Robert Mitchum? Probably one of the baddest-ass actors that ever lived, Mickey Rooney. <laughs> There's Mickey Rooney. Mickey Rooney is the only one. He, look, I mean, you look at this artwork. This is what I love. James Mitchum is look. He's he's looking cool, right? Like I got these guys in my sights. Oh, Hugh O'Brien. He's getting his gun locked and loaded. Mickey Rooney is out of his mind. The gun is blazing. He's just insane. He's a mad dog. He's a mad dog. He's Mickey Rooney. It's Mickey Rooney. He's a mad dog. This is from 1966. Uh, basically, it's a uh, you know it, it, it these, they're trying to save General MacArthur. It's a, that's all it is. It's a World War II film, and uh, you know it's just it's kind of silly and fun at the same time. Uh, then you've also got uh, when eight bells toll, based on an Alistair MacLean novel. Those things are always a, a bit of fun, and this is uh, this is actually not bad. Um, this is maybe a notch above because it has a really really good cast. A very young. This is from 1971. A very young Anthony Hopkins. I think this was like the third or fourth film that he was in. Uh, Natalie Delon. Uh, Robert Morley, Jack Hawkins, who was in almost all these at the time, uh, Vanessa Redgrave's brother, Corin Redgrave. Good good stuff. Uh, directed by a French director, Etienne Perrier, who gives it a little bit of a more kind of continental feel. Um, Alistair McLean wrote a lot of these, uh, you know, including the aforementioned uh, Where Eagles Dare and Guns of Navarone. He wrote all that kind of stuff. And so you you get this, um, you get a pretty cool kind of an espionage wartime thing. Uh, about the uh, essentially uh, kind of like an espionage operation to uh, prevent the stealing of gold bullion uh, in the Irish Sea. That's basically the plot, and uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun little twists and turns. Uh, and Anthony Hopkins is as good then as he was now. And then Tony Curtis again, along with uh, Frank Lovejoy and Mary Murphy, in the Stuart Heisler directed Beachhead. This is from 1954. Um, and uh, is better than it has a right to be. This is uh, a marine story set in the uh, Pacific Theater. Uh, it, it's not quite... Um, 
it, it, you can tell it's a B movie, but it's uh, it's like a like a B plus, I guess is maybe the best way to do it. Anyway, it's uh, you know it's a, it's a bunch of guys fighting Japanese and and uh, guys on a mission. That's it. It's a war adventure, and uh, Lovejoy was a pretty solid director from the period. He you know he did a few things that were uh, that were somewhat memorable. So it's uh, uh, you know if you like the stars, definitely check it out. And then lastly, The Passage, uh, starring Anthony Quinn, James Mason, Christopher Lee, and Malcolm McDowell. And uh, this is uh, basically a, uh, a World War II resistance story uh, set in Spain and France around the Pyrenees. Uh, Malcolm McDowell is really particularly good in this. And uh, Patricia Neal is actually quite good. A, a young Kay Lenz also shows up, which always makes me happy because we like Kay Lenz because she was in, uh, in the, the Rod Stewart music video. Which one? Yeah. In fa- was it Infatuation? Oh, inf- was it Infatuation? I don't know. Yeah, I think it? it was Infatuation. I think that's where Kay Lenz was in. It was fantastic. Uh, so anyway, this is 1979. Uh, these film, this particular genre is getting a little old in the tooth at this point. Uh, directed by Jay Lee Thompson, kind of one of you know running to the end of his career at the time, but uh, still, actually, you know, uh, as far as movies that have that 1960s, uh, 50s, and 60s guys on a mission, uh, World War II, you know, Korean War sheen, uh, it, it sort of caps the genre off pretty well. This may be the very last of those films that was made. Force 10 from Navarone, I think, was the very, very last one. Force 10 from Navarone, probably made about the same time with Harrison Ford. Did you ever yeah, see that? Yeah, Harrison James Ford. Fox? Yeah, that was good. All right. Uh, and Mark, let's, uh, let's go into some Warner Archive stuff, if we could. Um, I want to make mention really first, this is not a Warner Archive release, but this is a Warner Catalog release on Blu-ray, never before on Blu-ray, I am elated. I know Mark does not share my affection for this film. Again, this is one of those movies that I uh, I worked when I was an usher at the theater, so I have a great fondness for it because I've seen this film at least a hundred times, easily a hundred times, um, maybe another fifty times on on uh, on VHS. It is now on Blu-ray, and my daughter is going to as soon as she is of age, and my wife is actually not in the uh, in the room. I am going to expose her to the glories of Hoserama. Strange Brew. I know. Thank you. Bob and Doug McKenzie. I know. Why do you not like this movie? It's just a bunch of guys going hosers, eh? No, it's not. It's not. It's There's deep. more. It's it. No, this it's is deep and meaningful. It's deep and meaningful. This is this is like this is like if Terrence Malick had done his version of Casablanca, it would be Strange Brew. Do you not understand that? <laughs> wow. Okay. Anyway, this is Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas playing Bob and Doug McKenzie, the characters that they originated on uh, SCTV. In a feature film that is so outrageously hilarious, they directed it, they wrote it. Uh, it it's just it's it's just beyond silly. They uh, right there, they, they're a couple of you know Canadian beer drinking goofballs with a TV show, and uh, they wind up getting involved in this whole bizarre caper with Max von Sydow. It's a whole beer oriented caper. I won't even tell you exactly the plot because it's just it, it's, it's, there's no point. But Max von Sydow is the bad guy. Paul Dooley is his uh, his henchman. And there's a whole silly frame up in here, and a court trial, and and an insane asylum. This movie is so beyond funny. Uh, and the the whole opening, their 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 little home movie of the post apocalyptic future with you know, hey, fleshy headed mutant Rick Moranis wearing the jock strap. Come on, how do you not love this? Maybe I missed. You know, I, I admit I might have missed the boat. You know what? SCTV to me was never as funny as SNL really? and some of the other stuff. No. Oh my gosh, I loved it. Really? Oh, I lived no, for SCTV. SCTV seemed more cultish. It was more well, of a cult thing. More Canadian. It's definitely more Canadian. And Canadians right. aren't funny, eh? All right. So uh, back to the Warner Archive. Two more Blu-rays, Mark. Oh, me. Yes. A Mighty Wind is uh, directed by Christopher Guest. This was part of his little, uh, you know, his uh, docu comedy thing that he uh, perfected and had a great run at. Obviously, the the ones that I love are Waiting for Guffman and Best in Show is hilarious. Mighty Wind, which is this one, was good. For Your Consideration, which he did three years later, was the one that seemed like a misfire to me. And I'm like, I think that the whole docu-comedy thing might be uh, ha- might have run its course when it comes to Christopher Guest. And uh, he hasn't really done much since. But Mighty Wind was very funny. It's really cute. And what's great about it is because all these guys are actually musicians, uh, the music is great. You know, Michael McKean is a musician. You know, Harry Shearer is a musician. And obviously, uh, Christopher Guest is a musician. So the music is terrific. And it's all about this uh, this 60s era, you know, folk band. 
And uh, so it's sweet and warm and funny. And even the, uh, even the title, A Mighty Wind, is a double entendre. That shows you how clever it is. There's an audio commentary with guest and uh, Eugene Levy. Really funny stuff. There's a half hour of additional scenes, including a couple extra songs. So, uh, yeah, A Mighty Wind is really great. It's a terrific film. Less terrific is a film that uh, I was so young that I liked it because I didn't realize what bad films were back then. Ice Pirates. Ice Pirates stars Robert Urich and Mary Crosby. This is the worst movie. <laughs> this was so horrific. Well, here's the thing. It's not supposed to be great. I mean, it's a, it's a bit, it's a, it's a bit spoofy. It, it, it's, it's, well, it's very spoofy, but it's spoofy without being funny. I know, but it's got a good cast. It has uh, Angelica Houston was in this. Ron Perlman was in this. Both so they're all so young looking. Anyway, it's about uh, you know a bunch of swashbuckling uh, ice pirates in space. What are you gonna do? I, I would seriously pass on this. Mighty Wind though is definitely worth it. All right, and then rounding out our uh, our Warner Archive coverage. Uh, three that are just regular DVD-Rs, MODs. Uh, this is the George O'Brien Western Collection, nine films, if you like all those old George O'Brien uh, programmers. There's just a ton of them on here. Lawless Valley, Trouble in Sundown, Bullet Code, Prairie Law. I mean, these, t- these titles are going to mean nothing to you. Uh, these are of interest only if you actually like George O'Brien and might have uh, an affection for the genre in general. Otherwise, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, the two that are a little more significant, uh, Robert Mitchum in The Angry Hills, which is uh, a Robert Aldrich film that uh, has not gotten uh, enough praise over the years, from 1959, the year of uh, Ben-Hur. And uh, when you have a movie like Ben-Hur that opens in uh, in a year like that, it tends to overshadow everything else. But uh, really, really good cast here, beautifully, beautifully made. Uh, this uh, basically is a World War II adventure film with Robert Mitchum as a war correspondent in uh, in Greece. Uh, during the uh, occupation period, the German occupation period, and uh, you know you get a little little touch of the Greek resistance uh, story, and it's it's good. I mean, it's it's nothing. Uh it's not, un- it's not unique for the genre, but it's a good solid entry in the genre. And then the other one is Take the High Ground, which was uh, one, of the, it's one of the best Richard Widmark performances uh, that he has not gotten enough perf- uh, credit for. Directed by Richard Brooks, produced by the great Dory Sherry. Really, really a lot of fun. Carl Malden is also in this, who's kind of like the best supporting actor that anybody could ever hope for. I mean, he was, if you wanted to make a movie feel serious, if you wanted to really, really, I mean, he, classic supporting actor, right? He never stole a scene. He never showed anybody up, but he just kind of came into a scene and he made everything better. And, and he, had a, he had a cauliflower nose. Yeah, so good. Anyway. Uh, no, Richard Brooks, really, really good here, written by Millard Kaufman. I mean, it's, it's a, a list all the way across. And... Um, Richard Widmark, just absolutely fantastic. Really, really good, uh, really good kind of combat footage in here as well. Uh, the uh, won an Oscar in 1953 for the uh, for the screenplay, and uh, very deservedly. So uh, you know, it's uh, as far as these as far as war films from the 1950s go, anything of that pre Bridge in the River Kwai period when Kwai really kind of changed the the ball game. Um, it's really, really good. So uh, always fun to dis- make you know discover those. Those unheralded, unsung war films. And uh, Richard Widmark, one of those guys that's just great in everything. Always really good in everything. All right, Mark, let's, uh, let's cover some foreign stuff. Um, you are far more uh, affectionate toward this film than I am. I, I find that thing kind of... I, felt, I, felt, I feel like this is a morally reprehensible movie that they, they, they were trying to guilt me into liking. And I, I resent that. Well, I, I don't know that I would say uh, I'm affectionate towards a film about something that is so, like, you know, a, a, a bleak and depressing. But uh, The Tribe is a film that uh, I, I was really taken by. You know what it is? It's like we, I think we touched upon this a little bit last week. Um, it's rare that you see a film that forces you to look at a movie a new way. It forces you to receive what a film has to say in a brand new way. And they did this in the tribe, and this is out of the Ukraine. This is a film that is uh, com- told completely in sign language, the whole thing. And there's no dialogue. It's all sign language. And the director, whose name I will not even attempt to uh, pronounce, uh, although the first name is Miroslav. That, that one I can get. Forget the last name. Uh, it's, uh, he just sticks to his guns, man. And it's, I thought it was absolutely just an incredible – you know what it was? It was, a, it was a great experience in terms of watching a film. So it's yeah. all about these kids at this uh, 
at this home for that. the deaf. And it turns out that the you know normally when you look at deaf kids, you think, oh, they're poor deaf kids. Their life is so poor. Them. These kids are the most gigantic a holes you'll they're ever hard. meet. Yeah. They're gang members. They rob people. They're violent. They're just not <laughs> nice kids. They're horrible people. So not only does it does it upend the um, the way that you look at a film because again it's all sign language you, you you have to try to parse what they yeah. mean but also it takes the cliche of like the poor angelic deaf kid he's so wonderful and it even turns that on its ear yeah so I based on those two I thought this thing was really striking I thought it was just I mean it's it's long it's over two hours but it's, I thought the tribe was one of just the most unique experiences of of the last ten years in terms of just watching a film yeah I guess I, you know, it's just it's not pleasant. It's no, unique. it's not pleasant. But, it's you know, unique. Plenty of films aren't pleasant, but Look, you know, I, I I could have a unique experience watching a film if I had somebody like if I had a dentist drilling a root canal while I was watching it. All right, but that don't wouldn't... don't say that because I have to have major. By the way, I have to have major dental work done, and my really? and you know what, my uh, my dental insurance does not cover what they want to do because my dental insurance they they think what I want to do is cosmetic. Yeah, which it is not. It is work that I need. Then you argue. You argue that I'm going to try. I'm, 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 I'm going to go through my my. So get this: if I want to get everything done that the dentist wants me to get done, over four thousand dollars. Now, six hundred of the four thousand. Okay, you'll laugh at me. Six hundred of the four thousand dollars is for sedation because I'm scared of dentists. So I'm like, you know, you know, it's okay. So six hundred. That's that. That's on me. Okay. But it's like thirty five hundred dollars worth of dental uh, surgery. That insurance will not cover one penny of it. And that's why I get my teeth cleaned every six months. Now, uh, well, th- this th- there's a particular part of my mouth. This is very exciting stuff. There's a particular part of my mouth that's been a disaster area for most of my life, yeah. and like every ten years, it comes. I I I, I have an implant. I have a tooth. I have Do you implant. really? Yes. And when I got the implant, it was so traumatic. Because they, I was awake, and obviously they they anesthetize you. But literally, in installing this implant, they, they the woman took it was a peri, a peri this woman was a, the periodontist. Sure, she took a hammer and chisel, an effing hammer and an effing chisel, uh-huh. and was going poof, 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 to get the implant in. And it doesn't hurt because you're anesthetized, but you feel this creepy horror movie thing going on in your head and your skull. And I was like, I I, I, I thought I was gonna cry when it was done. I was like, I can't believe I just I, – so I was scared of dentists for like 10 years, and so now I have to go back and get more work done. There you go. Well, uh, I am going to lavish praise on my favorite film of the year, which is out on uh, Blu-ray. Uh, thank goodness. This was a uh, can uh, – an entry in – it was in competition at the uh, 2014 uh, Cannes Film Festival. And it was released in 2015 to not enough fanfare by Sony Pictures Classics. I don't blame Sony Pictures Classics. They have always done a wonderful job with Zhang Yimou films. For whatever movie, for whatever reason, this movie simply did not catch fire. It was, I, I don't know if it was the marketing. I don't know if it was the wrong time. I don't know what it was. But um, the, Zhang Yimou, of course, one of uh, arguably my favorite director in the world uh, right now, my favorite living director. And uh, after his little period, of, you know, he sort of went wayward after his very gritty kind of neorealistic uh, Chinese films like Raise the Red Lantern and Judo and To Live and uh, Not One Less. And there's a lot of wonderful, wonderful films. Then, of course, he started doing, you know, the the House of Flying Daggers and a lot of uh, Hero and a lot of these sort of more extravagant things, which he's doing again. You know, he's got this this big uh, war film, this English language war film that's going to be coming out next year. Um, and then he, he's, he, with this film, he came back home again. He came back to the kind of filmmaking that he's, that he's always been excelled at. It's called Coming Home, uh, paired again with Gong Li, his one-time partner, who I think gives a performance that should have been nominated for an Academy Award. She is unbelievable in this movie. Here is basically the story. This is a story of a man who, during the Cultural Revolution, is a dissident, he is uh, he he has he has escaped. He is now a fugitive. He's on his way home, and uh, he's on his way home to his wife play, and, and daughter, played by Gong Li. He is effectively turned in by his own daughter, who has been in, so indoctrinated by the uh, by the system that when they get wind of his coming home, his daughter turns him in. The officials are able to capture him, and he and his wife only see each other at a distance. They call to each other at a distance at the train station before the uh, the officials haul him away again. Years later, daughter is grown, he is finally released, and he gets to go home again. He's considered a, a good citizen. And uh, he goes home only to find out that for whatever reason, the trauma of that period has left his wife with amnesia, and she no longer recognizes him. And the rest of the movie is about him 
trying to his daughter trying to reconcile herself that this is all her fault and that she somehow caused this and uh it, with him trying to jog his wife's memory so that they can have that reunion that that incredibly cathartic reunification that we have wanted ever since that first frame these two people calling to each other across a train station if this doesn't sound like the most gut-wrenching heart-searing uh, melodrama you've ever heard. It is It is a magnificent film, incredibly well told. It is poetic, it is powerful, it is gut-wrenching, it is heartbreaking. And it has one scene in it. I will only tell you it's the piano scene. I, I, make, I, I make no qualifications on this. It is the single best directed piece of filmmaking that we have seen at any point in 2015. Nothing in Spotlight, nothing in The Revenant, Nothing in the in uh, in in the uh, in, in any other film uh, compares. Nothing compares from last year. Not uh, the big short. Nothing. There is nothing that compares to this one scene in this film. It is the best bit of filmmaking you will see in any movie from 2015. So get yourself the Blu-ray of uh, Zhang Yimou's Coming Home with Gong Li. It will just tear your heart out. It is an absolutely wonderful film. And a good double feature with the other coming home with John Voight and Jane Fonda. Uh, well, which is a good film, but you know, <laughs> let's 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 not go overboard. Exactly. Okay, Labyrinth of Lies. Didn't we talk about this like a month ago or something? Labyrinth of Lies. Labyrinth of Lies. Uh, this the, is the German film. Yeah. This. Uh, oh, we did. No, we didn't talk about it. No. Uh, you this, and I may have talked about it separately, that's like true. during awards time. We did, in fact. You and I had that conversation. You were you were warning me off of it. I was warning you off yeah. it because uh, although the film uh, the film has a very interesting premise because after World War II ended and Germany lost, the government tried to pretty much wipe out any knowledge of Nazis from the German people. Yeah. The German people went through like, you know, the, the late 40s into the 50s, not even realizing that there was like a Nazi Germany with who, that killed millions. Which is not a good thing, by the way. I, I mean, it's sort of like well-intentioned, but you, you, you inadvertently sow the seeds of that to come back again, but anyway. You're erasing your yeah. own history. Yeah. Yeah, and this is obviously before the internet, <laughs> so yeah. whatever. So it's like, if the government says it didn't happen, I guess it didn't happen. And it was just, it's a horrible tragedy. So this is based on a true story about this one uh, German, um, this one German prosecutor who uh, begins to examine this case of a teacher who was identified as being an Auschwitz guard. And the prosecutor says, Auschwitz, what's that? Oh, there were Nazis. Oh, they killed people. Oh my God. And it's a true story. You know, and so the uh, the other people in his office and certain people in the government do not want him to pursue this case because it's going to open up all these old wounds that the government spent years trying to cover up. And of course, he has to because you know it's history is history, and you can't hide your history. So, Labyrinth of Lies is a is has a very interesting true story premise. My problem with it is that it is way too mainstream. This is a film that just it, it looks pretty, sounds pretty melodramatic it's just straight down the middle almost too carefully written almost too carefully acted it needs to be just angrier and a little bit more subversive it's just it, it just feels like it feels like a john grisham movie yeah like a movie based on a john grisham novel it just feels like that i just felt like it was just the wrong way to go but again it's a very interesting piece of german history which might be worth it to watch just to kind of get that out there um so that is labyrinth of lies we have a couple other good um foreign films to talk about victoria now victoria don't get nervous victoria is a film it is uh it's about, it's an hour and 38 minutes long one take yeah now i don't know who knows whether there was yeah. some finagling going on with the one take but it's one of the one of those in theory the, the, the birdman thing yes in yeah. theory it is a two hour and 20 a lot of people minute prefer film. this to birdman a lot of people really thought this was like the for that for the for the indulgence that this was a more interesting exercise, but whatever. Well, the thing is that you know, Birdman is about Hollywood and actors and playing superheroes and basically millionaires making yeah. uh, making decisions. This is more about this this one girl. She's a party girl. She's a she's a runaway, and so she and her friends hit the town to party. And so you know, they go in and out of nightclubs and restaurants, and uh, you know, the, she flirts with guys, and it's all done in one take. So as a stylistic piece, it is definitely dazzling but what's good about it is that there's good character development in it the acting is really good you know it throws us into it there's some improvisation going on at least i'm pretty sure there was some improvisation going on you can kind of tell um so even if you take the stuntness out of it it's still a pretty good film so uh, that's called victorious so definitely check that out um also 
Now, I don't know if we've talked about Tinto Brass in the past. Tinto Brass. Oh, we've talked a lot about Tinto Brass. All his movies are women in garters with their 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 butts hanging out. This movie actually that's has a, this movie has actually has a, a, a woman's bare ass that's, on that's, the that's, on the DVD cover. Yes, that's so Tinto you will not Brass. be you will not be able to buy this at Walmart. No. So Paprika. <laughs> By the way, Tinto Brass is still around. He, I, know. Uh, I don't know when he's, I don't know when his last film was, but he's still around. Anyway, uh, Tinto Brass uh, did Paprika. This is a film about a uh, uh, this young girl, you know, this innocent, naive country girl who wants to uh, help her fiance start his own business. So of course, she decides to become a prostitute and work in a brothel. Well, that, it's the same old story, right? I mean, it always happens that way. You know, honestly, my mother, the the the, the time she spent in the brothel. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> you know what? Look, I have to it's tell you something. Uh, uh, I needed to be put through college, and that's what my mother did. Um, you, oh, you want to talk about that real quick, or should I do this? You do that. Okay. So uh, an, another Asian film this week, a Korean film, also one of my favorite films of last year. I guarantee you I'm the only person who put this on a top ten anywhere um, because nobody else saw this, and it really breaks my heart. This is from Wellgo. Uh, this is a magnificent unbelievably great, great movie. You, you have to do yourself the favor of seeing this. It is, the, it is the greatest movie, the strangest film with the most bizarre pedigree. It's called The Beauty Inside. Uh, now, the, here's, the, here's the basic rundown of The Beauty Inside. Um, this, was a, this was based on a web series. There's like a serialized web series of years ago. I, I think it's early 2000s which was junk. It was horrible. Based on the same premise, the, this, is, this takes a, this horrible web series with this premise that was seemed... I mean, I remember it being advertised on buses at the time. You know, Beauty Inside. And I just thought, that's the stupidest sounding, sounding thing. And the, thing, the, the show was dumb and it made no sense. And somehow, uh, magically, uh, this thing becomes this incredible... Um, this amazing art film, this Korean art film, they saw something in this concept that nobody else has seen, and it is just absolutely spectacular. I'm not going to even try to pronounce the director's name. I will uh, absolutely destroy it. Um, yeah, I, 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 it, uh, it's just going to be bad if I try to pronounce it. But anyway, and, and so I apologize. I'm not good with Korean names. But the beauty inside, here's the premise. It is about an individual, a man who wakes up every morning as someone else. Some different races, different ages, different gender. Every, every morning, he is a different person. And he, he's, a very, he's reclusive and he makes furniture, so he doesn't have to interact with people. But every morning, he's a different person. And sometimes, he's even a different nationality. And he'll like call you know, his mom... Uh, knows about this, and he has a friend who works with him at the business who who knows about this, who's accustomed to the fact that every time he comes to sort of do some paperwork and do a little bit of business, he he's going to see a completely different individual, but he knows it's the same person. And the question is then, when he falls in love with a woman, how does he have a relationship with her when it, as soon as he falls asleep, he knows he's going to wake up and be someone else? How do you how do you even develop or maintain a relationship under those circumstances? This thing is so mind blowing, so beautiful, so incredibly well executed, and you've got it's like they, they have to it has to be like fifty or sixty different actors that play the part, and there's and there's actual continuity. You as an audience member grow to love this character, even though you know that every five or ten minutes you're going to be seeing a different actor playing the character. It's amazing. It's just breathtaking that something that we talk about turning a sow's ear into a silk purse. Really amazing. Uh, the Beauty Inside uh, on Blu-ray from Wellgo. Don't miss it. It is absolutely wonderful. Wade Major. Love it. Uh, Partisan is uh, kind of an interesting little movie with uh, Vincent Cassell, who doesn't always make interesting movies, although he's always an interesting, if slightly annoying actor. Um, this is uh, the debut feature from an Australian director named Ariel Kleiman, and this is about this – it takes place in this environment. It's not really named. You don't really know where it is. I don't think it's in the future, but you just don't know where the kids who live in this environment are trained from birth to be assassins. So the main character is this 11-year-old kid named is Alexander, and he is being trained to be an assassin. You see him – you know, you see him uh, uh, a training by killing people with, you know, with like uh, uh, paintball guns, you know, to kind of practice. And uh, at, as such, it does have a lot of black humor. So it's a little bit like Dogtooth. If you saw Dogtooth, a lot of humor in that. Um, 
so it's this really interesting sort of like uh, alternate universe world. And so Vincent Cassell sort of befriends this this kid, and it's all about their uh, their little adventure. So uh, Partisan is definitely a cool movie. The cinematography is great. It's just a very gray, decaying, grimy looking, almost like Eastern European sort of uh, locale. Um, Casal is really good in it. The, the 11 year old kid is really good in it. So, uh, yeah. So it's a movie called partisan and I think you guys should definitely check it out. All right. And we'll, uh, a, f- a few more foreign Blu-rays. I will blow through real quickly before we uh, start to wrap this up. We might get to a couple of television titles, but if not, we'll, uh, we'll be good. Uh, a couple of, uh, Really interesting movies by Agnes Varda on a uh, double feature uh, release, Blu-ray from Cinelicious Picks. And these were both released actually just a few months ago theatrically together. One is Jane B. par Agnes V., which is a profile of Jane Birkin by Agnes Varda. And then the other one is Kung Fu Master, starring Jane Birkin. These were made back-to-back. And uh, Kung Fu Master is kind of a, you know, it's a May-December relationship movie, kind of a Harold and... Uh, mod kind of a thing with Jane Birkin as a woman who uh, winds up having a love affair with a younger boy. It takes its name from the video game Kung Fu Master, which the younger boy plays is basically a, a, a colleague of her or a co- classmate of her son, a 40 year old woman, 14 year old kid. Should be really kind of troubling. Um, the kid is played by Mathieu Demi, who is the uh, son of. Um, Agnes Varda and Jacques Demy, her, her husband at the time, who was the, of course, director of uh, Umbrellas of Cherbourg and many other great films. Charlotte Gainsbourg is also in the film, who was Jane Birkin's daughter by uh, Claude Gains- uh, uh, Serge Gainsbourg. So it's uh, a lot of French uh, showbiz royalty in this film, uh, but a really, really interesting movie. Very nicely done. Uh, still has all of that kind of cool new wave um, s- style to it and sensibilities that uh, that Agnes Varda brought to everything. And then Jane B. Par Agnes V. is uh, is really a very interesting look at uh, Jane Birkin, uh, talking about her. You know, it's got some weird weird little kind of fictional sequences in it that, that wo- weave into the rest of it. It's a very interesting uh, celebrity profile. So definitely worth checking out on Blu-ray. And then we also have uh, a not-so-great film called Paulette, which is a movie about an old French lady who uh, basically becomes a, you know, a marijuana grower and a drug dealer in order to be able to make ends meet. Uh, it means to be funny and to have kind of social commentary at the same time. This is from Cohen, um, who I love dearly, but I don't particularly love this movie very much. It, it just feels like a minor French film, minor French comedy that doesn't probably have much of an appeal to, uh, to an American audience. Did not do particularly well at the time. And uh, then we also have, uh, on Blu-ray, we talked about this some weeks ago, the Eric Romer film, The Marquis of O, from Film uh, Movement Classics. That won the grand prize at the Cannes Film Festival. That is actually out on Blu-ray now, as well as DVD. And then, most significantly, a really, really big deal, uh, three... Taviani brother films that were uh, previously out on DVD ages ago, never released since. Now they're out in amazing blue, amazing three film Blu-ray collection from the Cohen Film Collection. This is fantastic for film fans. If you love the Taviani brothers, these are three of their best films: um, Padre Padrone, The Night of the Shooting Stars, and Chaos K A O S. Uh, everything that makes the Tavianis wonderful is in these films, especially Night of the Shooting Stars, which is sort of their quintessential uh, film, and Padre Padrone, which is nearly, nearly as good. Uh, this is a great little uh, small box set, three films from uh, Cohen Film Collection uh, in uh, Blu-ray. Really, really beautiful. And with that, I think... Uh, actually, you know what? Lastly, um, Mark, let's just make a mention of uh, Game of Thrones' complete uh, fifth season. As the thing starts up again, I, I, I'm so over the Game of Thrones thing, but uh, this is out on DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, you know, it won 12 Emmys, man. What's up with that? Is it that good? Is it really? Do you think it's that good? Yeah, people love that stuff. It's a phenomenon. Yes. All right. Well, anyway, so that's uh, Game of Thrones Season 5. It is out with giant gobs of extras. The Blu-ray, obviously, is the one that you want to get. Uh, it's got uh, tons and tons of featurettes and documentaries and it, in, you know, a guide that just really, really fun stuff. They really, really blow this thing out. So 
Anyway, uh, load that up. That comes with in uh, Blu-ray and ultraviolet, and uh, that way you can watch your Game of Thrones, get it on on your phone and your iPad and anything else and anywhere else you want. We'll be back next week. <laughs>